Though we'll move directly to our next speaker, which will be Nicholas Korsbo, who will be talking about um, essentially uh, who will be talking about understanding heterogeneous health outcomes with CIML and Puma. So take it away. Hi, hi, thank you. So my name is Niklas Korsbo. I'm a scientist at Pumas AI, and yeah, I'll be talking about uh, modeling healthcare. Um, so today we live in this age of patient-specific data, where we have access to data coming in from clinical tests or monitoring devices or medical images or omics, or even like wearables such as your smartwatch. But a key question is, what kind of information is actually predictive? And how do you utilize these predictive factors in order to make the best decisions? And so we think that effective use of data is one key component of patient-specific analyses. Another key component is the knowledge that we already have about our systems. So we're studying some specific disease or some specific treatment, and we might know something about the molecular interactions or the cellular interactions that are actually important for those processes. And we might also know some of the covariates that might be informative of patient outcomes. And all of that knowledge is highly important to us. So we don't want to just throw it away which is why we tend to do scientific machine learning, where the idea is then to combine data-driven machine learning with knowledge-driven modeling in order to then make the best possible predictions. So we'll have a look at modeling patient outcomes. And typically we want to see how a model outcome can, uh, how a patient outcome can evolve over time. So you might have data coming from a clinical trial where people have been tra tracked for a while, and you want to see what is driving the disease progression, what is driving the, the effect of treatment. So for that, you tend to use a dynamical system, so a set of ordinary differential equations. And now looking at the data, it seems as if we have a bit of noise in here, right? So we're going to add an error model to account for that noise as well. And if you look even more closely, you'll see that when you actually look at more than one patient, if you check many patients, you see that they are different and they are more different than you would expect from just some observational noise. And it's because like human beings are different. Um, and therefore we are modeling them with individual parameter values. And so these individual parameter values, they're coming from uh, some typical values that is shared amongst the entire population that we're modeling. And we have some random effects, which are distributions that characterize the variability between different patients. Uh, how much are they varying? And finally, we say that we don't just want to characterize the heterogeneity. We want to be able to predict it. Um, and there we use patient data. So the idea is that we want to be able to measure something about our patients and hopefully use that to inform us of what their individual parameters should be and therefore to better predict their, their outcomes. And so this modeling structure is called a nonlinear mixed effect modeling. And it's a pretty nice structure in, in the sense that you can encode your scientific knowledge. If you know about the molecular interactions that are important or about how covariates can affect the system, this is a nice way to encode that. But there is sometimes some problems in knowing what to do, how to create such a model. And this is where we're turning to machine learning. So first, just what is a, a neural network? The neural network is an information processing mechanism it's usually based on the ideas of a neuron, where every neuron takes a bunch of inputs, it processes that input, and it provides an output. You stitch a bunch of these neurons together in a network, and you get something that's quite good at processing information. And for us, it's important that mathematically, most neural networks are just functions. So neural networks are actually usable anywhere where you would use a function. And we use functions all over the place. And also, neural networks are universal approximators, meaning that if they're large enough, then they can approximate any mathematical function. And the functional form that they end up approximating is tuned by its parameters. And that parameter tuning can be linked to, for example, observed patient outcomes. And this gives us a way to use data to automatically discover functional relationships that might exist in our model. So coming back to the NLME structure, so what if you now have some input data that you just don't know what to do with? 
So you might have some, some data from blood tests or genomics, or you might have some images, and it's not at all trivial to figure out how to use that information. And this is where we are turning to something that we call deep NLM, where the idea is that we want to augment the model with neural networks such that they can automatically discover how to process that information in order to turn it into something useful. And thereby, allowing us to explain why some people's fare well and some people's don't uh, for different treatments. And not only that, um, but we also might have trouble defining our dynamical systems. That's quite common that you don't quite know what, uh, what to model. And so again, if you're uncertain about something, you can just stick a neural network straight in there and have it uh, capture the interactions that you might be missing. So with this, we're hoping that we can create uh, good models to make good predictions. Uh, and this should all work because the neural networks, their functions, we have automatic differentiation in both the NLME structure as well as the neural networks. So we should be able to just train everything in, in concert, right? So now we'll have a look at accounting for patient heterogeneity. So here we did a synthetic analysis where we generate a or define a data generating model. We generate some synthetic data. And in that data, you can hide some pieces of information or you can have some noise. And then you use that data to fit a, a deep NLME model. And now, because we've used synthetic data, we know the ground truth. So we can evaluate success, which is something that is uh, a rare ability if you're working with real data where you have no idea what the true answer is. So does it work? So here I'm showing you uh, some synthetic data and this is test data. So the model has never seen this before. We have access to the ground truth. So this is a population prediction from the data generating model. And here a population prediction means that we're not using the random effects. This is a real prediction, but it's from the true model. So the prediction is pretty good. Uh, we can have a look at a population average, which is a population prediction that doesn't use any of the patient data. So here the prediction is the same for every patient. Um, and this is something that we want to improve upon. Right? And then finally, we have a look at the deep NLME prediction. So this is a prediction coming only from baseline values. So this is information we had at time zero. We're using that information to predict a full time course. And we see that we can uh, match the, the results of the true model quite nicely. So here we have it for uh, four virtual patients, but virtual patients are cheap. So we can have a look at thousands more. And we see that the deep anatomy prediction matches the truth uh, really quite nicely. So does it work? I, I would say yes. Well, at least in this case, right? So here we have the synthetic data that was generated using 10 linear covariates where 100% of the patient variation was actually explainable by the data. And we were using 200 training uh, subjects. So it doesn't generalize to anything else. So we can have a look at bigger data. So here we're using 1,000 covariates instead, and that seems to be perfectly all right. We can have a look at different dynamical systems. So here, the and the data we generated is coming from a different dynamical model. And this approach is quite agnostic to that, so it works fine. We can have a look at nonlinear covariates, so where the, the relationship between the data you can uh, gather from your patients and their, their uh, individual parameter values, it's nonlinear, it's unintuitive, it's hard to figure out. But neural networks are quite good at capturing such things, so we're doing well here too. And then finally, we can have a look at imperfect covariates or data where you, uh, where only a small fraction of the patient variation is actually explainable within the data that you have. This is a common case. And here we see that the deep LNME prediction, it doesn't perfectly hit the data points here, but you wouldn't quite expect it to because it doesn't have enough information. And indeed, if you look at the true model, if you give that the same data and it uses the data in the correct way, then you see that the, the, the true model has predictions that are the same as the deep NLME model. So this indicates that the deep NLME uh, model has accurately identified how to utilize the data that it has. It doesn't overfit, it doesn't underfit, it uses the data that we have access to. So 
After we've done this, we can ask ourselves, what were the relevant prognostic factors? Uh, and one key question would be, what data is worth collecting in the future? So here we can ask ourselves, um, how much does each of the covariates help explain patient variability? And we could do thresholding here and say that if they're not important enough, we can stop sampling them. And this is important if we want to go from a, a clinical trial setting where a lot of resources is dedicated to each patient into a hospital setting where you might not want to collect all of that, in, all of that data. Furthermore, we could ask ourselves what information or what relationships do the neural network actually discover? And so here we're looking at using symbolic identification from data-driven DFEQ um, in order to figure out what the neural network ended up approximating such that we can make the models interpretable and so that we can map it back towards biology again and formulate new scientific hypotheses that we can actually test and sanity check. So next, we'll have a look at automatic identification of uh, dynamics. And so in this slide, we're going to assume that we have no prior knowledge, really. Uh, we want to identify both the prognostic factors um, as well as the entire dynamical system, all from the data. So we try that. And again, we see that, yeah, this just works. It works. And um, so what we did here was to have a fully data-driven and fully automatic model identification. And what's more, this took me about 15 minutes to run. Uh, and I say run, I mean fit, not just simulate, but to fit this. So that could be compared to the weeks and months that you might spend as a modeler trying to figure out how, how um, what your dynamics are. So once you have a fitted model, you can start making predictions uh, of it. So here we have a model that we trained on uh, one dosage regimen. So you see that we get one dose per week. And now you can ask yourself, what if we change the dosage regimen? So I'm going to um, double the frequency of the dosing, but just take half the dose each time. And we make a prediction there. And we see that the deep LNME prediction is, again, uh, spot on. And you can do the same if you increase the dosing interval and increase the dose. We again make perfect predictions. And it's sort of worth highlighting here that what we're making here is perfect predictions in novel scenarios that we've never trained on before. We've only ever trained on a single dosage regimen, and we're predicting other doses. And, and we are doing this on an individual patient level. And if you can do that, right, if you can make predictions for an individual patient based only on their baseline data, on what you can gather at time zero, now you can start really optimizing dose to them, right? Now you can start computationally optimizing their dosage regimens and how to treat them in order to achieve the best healthcare outcomes. So in summary, with deep anatomy, we can accurately account for patient heterogeneity we can uh, identify partial or even entire dynamical system. And with that, we hope to make uh, effective de novo model identification possible, as well as effective augmentation of pre-existing model where you already have a lot of information and you just want to see if you can squeeze a little bit of extra power out of your modeling. And in the very near future, we'll be looking at using entire images and omics and other pieces of uh, data all mixed together seamlessly in order to make the best predictions possible. And again, this should really work. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you and acknowledge the, the people that we've been working with, especially Chris Elrod and Julius Martinson. Uh, and I would again also like to say that uh, the deep the Deep Pumas team is hiring. So if you're interested in this kind of work, we have two positions open. Check us out. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. So we're looking at uh, the Discord and, and Slack and getting some questions. So one one question that I'll uh, that I have for you is, um, you know, what what's this translation? Uh, what what's the path to translation to to the clinic, right? So you know, like uh, you know, it's really nice to always have examples of, of something working on on you know example data and everything, but you know. Are, how is this going to, you know, change a clinical trial? What's, what's the timeline that, that's going on there? So it's already happening, right? So 
uh, we are developing this like not in a vacuum. Uh, we are developing the core basic research as well as the software while simultaneously doing um, consulting projects with uh, with other partners in, in pharmacology. So this is already being used on the ground and we are already squeezing information out of data sets uh, and finding that we, we do get good results. We don't get the same kind of perfection that we've seen here because like we don't have access to perfect data at any time at all. But indeed, we seem to be beating the state, the, the previous state of the art. Yeah, and um, and a question that we have on the Discord here is: What types of scenarios would the clinic be open to trusting machine learning models? Like, you know, where where does this work with trust and and you know regulation? Like, what wh what's the point where we can say like, oh, you can trust the neural network to to choose your dosing mm. for you? Yeah, that's actually that's a good and tricky question. Um, regulatorily. It is being opened up a little bit to to machine learning or black boxes. You can probe them. You can you can see if they do any anything extreme uh, for extreme input, and you can sign it to check them a little bit. Um, so that gives you a little bit more confidence, but it's still uh, difficult. One promising approach is then symbolic identification, especially for the dynamical system. If you can symbolically identify what your neural network ended up. Uh, approximating, and then simply replace your neural network with that identified equation, then you don't have a problem anymore, right? You've used the neural network in the modeling creation or modeling definition, but you don't have to keep it when you move to, to hospital. And that makes your model interpretable and you can sanity check it, making sure that like it's not going to blow up because some patient has some weird values. Right? Yeah, and we have a question from the YouTube now, which is, how do you account for patient heterogeneity? Is there a specific hyperparameter in your model that accounts for it? Yes, um, yes, uh, like we have here. So uh, patient heterogeneity, we account for it in, with the individual parameters, right? And we have this slush bucket term here, the random effect. So these are distributions that capture anything that's sort of left on the table or anything that, that we are unable to, to characterize. Right? So the patient heterogeneity is then coming from the individual parameters, that's coming from the typical values, from patient data, and from the random effects. Yep, and that's about time. So everyone thank our speaker, Nicholas. Um,